Hello, my name is Barrett Friesen, and today I'd like to talk to you about the intersection of native fish ecology, invasive fish species, and artificial reservoirs through the lens of my project at Lake Powell. To start, I'd like to point out the dire situation that exists in the Colorado River Basin. The abundance and range of many of the native river fishes has declined dramatically over the last century, leading to state and federal listing of many of the endemic and previously common species, such as the humpback chub, Colorado pike minnow, and razorback sucker. The challenges these native fish face include the fragmentation of the Colorado River and its tributaries by numerous large dams. This separates individuals into subpopulations and can lead to genetic bottlenecks, drift, and other stochastic events. Furthermore, dams create massive changes in the river flow regime. The once free flowing river is now basically a chain of artificial flows connecting artificial reservoirs. The background threat of climate change has led to the so-called millennium drought in the desert Southwest, the driest period in over 400 years. Reduced snowpack leads to lower river flows, which leads to lower lake levels. Currently at Lake Powell, the lake level is at the lowest of its entire history since it first filled. And here you can see uh, one of the boat ramps, the very end at Lake Powell, and uh, it's left high and dry. It's well above the level of that water. The final threat to native fish and the focus of my research is invasive species. So non-native fish such as smallmouth bass were spread widely through the 20th century, both for recreational angling, as well as accidental and illegal introduction. Now these invasive species can prey upon or compete with native species for scarce resources. In the field of ecology, as we just heard from Ray, invasive species are often public enemy number one. Countless examples of catastrophic harm caused to ecosystems by invasives. Economic harm estimates range from 20 to $120 billion per year in the United States annually. And in the upper Colorado River Basin, about $1.7 million per year is spent controlling invasive fish. So it's possible to identify factors that allow invasive species to spread and thrive. Vectors and pathways represent the physical means by which invasives are transported to a new site. So that can include uh, ship's ballast water, or in my case, they can be flushed through a dam with lake water. The number of invaders is referred to as the propagule pressure. If only a few invasives reach a new area, then their chances of establishment is far lower than if new invaders are constantly arriving and arriving en masse. Disturbed systems are often far easier for invaders to colonize as they readily fill a vacuum created by a disturbance. And the Colorado River, of course, is highly modified from its original configuration. Finally, if the invaders are able to prey upon or otherwise benefit from native organisms, they stand a better chance of succeeding. So the looming threat of invasive species and their potential impact on native fish all comes together on the Colorado River at Lake Powell, specifically right at Glen Canyon Dam, which created the lake and essentially serves as the boundary between the upper and lower Colorado River Basin. Now, the current situation is that Lake Powell is full of non-native fish. Below Glen Canyon Dam in the Colorado River, there are imperiled native river fish. The concern is that current low lake levels in Lake Powell will allow the non-native fish to get through the dam and end up in the river below where they could interact with those natives. It's this concern that has prompted the Bureau of Reclamation to instigate this research project. So to finish setting the stage, I need to describe the relationship between the layers of water in Lake Powell and the physical structure of Glen Canyon Dam. Water leaves the lake and flows into the dam via the penstock, which is a huge pipe. Water then flows down to the hydroelectric turbines, which produce electricity, and then out into the river below. Historically, as shown here, water was withdrawn from the cold bottom layer of the lake, the hypolimnion, where there is very little oxygen, 
and essentially no fish, which means no risk of entrainment or fish getting sucked into the dam. However, current low lake levels have brought the top warm and productive layer of water, the epilimnion, into contact with that penstock. Now it's possible that non-native fish swimming around in the lake could be pulled into the dam where they would end up potentially end up in the river below. Now, I'll say the discharge from the warm epilimnion is act has actually improved conditions for those native fish below the dam, but any improvement they see from this warmer water could easily be offset by non-natives making it down below. So to get to my research objectives, I just split the title of my project in half. For my objective number one, I will characterize the spatial and temporal distribution of non-native fish in the lake in the area of the lake right close to the dam. This can be considered the entrainable population of non-native fish. The second half of my title gives my second research objective. So to identify the potential of escapement through the dam, I'll investigate the possibility that fish could survive a trip down through the penstock and through the hydroelectric turbine and emerge alive in the river below and able to interact with those native fish. So my study area is at Lake Powell, which of course is in Southern Utah and spills over into Northern Arizona. This dashed box here is what's shown in the aerial image. And my three part study area is contained within the dashed white oval. The four bay is immediately adjacent to Glen Canyon Dam. Confluence is slightly farther away. And then Waweep is where the marina and all those huge houseboats are. The four bay is characterized by very steep cliffs down to the canyon bottom, and you can see how close it is to Glen Canyon Dam here. Confluence, similarly, mostly steep cliffs, but also does have some shallows. And then Waweep, on the other hand, has many areas that are gently sloping, warm, shallow, and generally is considered better habitat for foraging and reproduction. So to quantify the habitat usage and movement of these non-native fish in Lake Powell, I'll implement a suite of sampling techniques that target different life stages and different habitats. To capture adult fish, I'm deploying gill nets, which are anchored at one end to the cliff wall or the shore, and then stretch out into the lake to entangle passing fish. This is a highly effective gear for most species in the adult life stage. In the top photo, I've anchored the end of the gill net to this vertical canyon wall in the forebay. And in the bottom picture, the end is anchored to shore in Wawi. To capture juvenile fish, I deploy baited minnow traps in the shallows. These are left overnight and juvenile fish are, can swim in, but then can't find their way out. Top photo shows a juvenile green sunfish captured in this way. Now to capture even younger fish, I pull an ichthyoplankton tow net behind the boat. The ichthyoplankton tow net features a very fine mesh that tapers in a cone down to the collecting cup. And the net captures larval fish drifting in the water column. So to supplement my capture methods, the Bureau of Reclamation conducts nighttime hydroacoustic surveys. This is basically a scientific grade uh, fish finder equipped with both down looking and side looking scanners. This method allows the direct observation of habitat usage. Here on this example scan, we can see two bands of fish, one between 30 and 40 meters depth, one between 50 and 60 meters depth, and the overall lake depth of about 100 meters. Finally, to investigate movement trends near the dam, I'll capture a set of 30 of these non-native fish, surgically implant them with ultrasonic transmitters, and then release them back into the lake. These transmitters emit an ultrasonic ping that it can be picked up by a network of shore-based receivers. And this will allow the observation of habitat usage and movement trends within the study area. To integrate the fish sampling data, I intend to construct habitat usage models in R, which link the presence or absence of the fish species to such predictor variables as water depth, temperature, and slope of the shoreline. Shown on the right is an uh, one of the input raster layers, which is a high resolution digital elevation model of lake bathymetry made available by the US Geological Survey. 
And the output of the habitat usage model is a probability or heat map, such as shown on the right. This purpose of the model is basically to predict where the fish will be under changing water levels and changing seasons. Moving on to my second research question, can a fish really survive going down through the penstock and the turbine and emerge alive in the river below? Well, examples of the types of turbines at Glen Canyon Dam are shown on the left. These spin around with the passing water and they spin around at 150 revolutions per minute. And you can imagine that a fish entering this rapidly spinning turbine might get chopped up like it's in a blender and that might happen. But there are other sources of potential mortality including violent accelerations, trauma from contacting the walls of the penstock, as well as rapid decompression due to changing pressures. All these together will serve to decrease the survival uh, chances of a fish going through the dam. To measure the conditions that fish would experience on such a trip, I'll use a small instrument called the sensor fish, which I will um, deploy through the penstock and turbines and it will record the conditions inside. The sensor fish is equipped with pressure and temperature sensors, as well as a gyroscope and a triaxial accelerometer. From the conditions it records, I can compare those two published fish physiological limits to model the likelihood of mortality. Such an analysis has previously been performed on the Columbia River for out-migrating salmon smolts going through the dams there. So ultimately my goal is to combine my two research objectives and start estimating some prob probabilities. For each non-native species, I can take the results of my first objective to estimate the probability of entrainment. And again, entrainment here refers to being sucked into the dam um, simply because their movement, the fish movement and habitat selection brings them spatially close to that dam penstock. For my second research objective, I can estimate the probability of fish surviving passage through the dam. Multiplying these two values together gives me an overall probability of successful passage, which will give an indication to the Bureau of Reclamation which species might be, uh, they, 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 which species they should potentially be most concerned about. Now, please note that this data shown here is purely hypothetical at this time. And these hypothetical probabilities are low, ranging from 0.25% up to 9%. But if you apply low probabilities to a large number of fish, you start talking about some real possibilities here. Now we suspect that passage of non-natives is already occurring, as recently large numbers of non-native shad have been found below the dam, and it's almost certain that they came down from the lake. If this study determines that non-native fish entrainment and survival are significant possibilities, there are operational steps that the Bureau of Reclamation could take to reduce the risk. One such step would be to switch from releasing water from the penstock down to the river outlet, which is 100 feet lower and currently still down in that hypolimian. However, this, this option would have a serious negative consequence. Thank you, Macy. As hydroelectric power could no longer be generated under this scenario. And if the, if the water level kept falling, uh, then eventually the epilimnion would be in contact uh, with those river outlets. So if you forget everything else about my project, here's, here are the takeaways of what I'm studying. We have a severe low water situation in the West leading to lower river flows and lower lake levels, including at Lake Powell. The low water could create a vector for non-native fish to enter the lower Colorado River. If the non-natives enter alive and in sufficient number, they could cause terrible harm to the imperiled native river fish species there. So I'd like to thank you, my audience, as well as the Bureau of Reclamation and the wonderful people there who I hope are watching online. Hi, Clarence. I'd like to thank my committee, as well as everybody else that's helped me along the way. And at this time, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? What level of survival? Yeah, what percentage of survival Yeah, that's a good question. And that, I guess, would be applied, depends on how, how many fish you're applying that percentage to. So you have, kind of have to tie it to how many 
uh, fish become entrained to um, apply the level of survival to that so you get an overall number of fish below to whether or not they can potentially establish a population. I think that would vary by species and I don't really want to comment on specific numbers, but just um, for instance, if you had those, those non-native shad would probably be less of a concern than something like smallmouth bass getting through, where if you had five or 10 of those that could potentially start breeding, that would be a concern, yeah. I may have missed, how are you gonna get at the probability of entrainment? Habitat usage. But do the fish swim away from a, you know, a intake current or swim toward it? Or? So, Good question. Thank you for that. Um, if they, if the fish spend time in the forebay and are selecting that the, the depth of the pen stock, then that will be a higher higher probability than if they don't come in the forebay. Mm -hmm. So I know it's flaming board dam. Mm -hmm. You know if they have different, they can raise the elevation of. Selective withdrawal. Yeah. So, has there been similar issues at Flaming Gorge as they withdraw from a higher elevation? Like, I'm just wondering if this has been a problem at other dams that you can draw kind of information from that as well. Or... I'm not sure to answer that question. If, if with regards to selective withdrawal, would they potentially be withdrawing selectively to and in training non-native fish? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I know they've got smallmouth bass issues that yeah. are a big deal and stuff too. And mm -hmm. All the mitigation efforts there are, you know, downstream. Right. Everything's coming from the reservoir through. Mm -hmm. so I haven't heard of it, um, but I, I couldn't say that, it, that it's not happening other places, but not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. By running it a bunch of times and generating a distribution of what it experiences. Cool. Yeah. Hopefully 30. Mm -hmm. But uh, the logistics of it are, are a little bit complicated. Yeah. fish moving through the dam structure, I would guess, because that's kind of a 24 seven possibility. Um, there's been a lot of education lately to, to anglers and hopefully it's working. The people are starting to know that they shouldn't illegally introduce fish. So I would, I would guess that fish coming through the dam would be a, a higher possibility. One more or not? Um, yeah, one more. Gordon. Um, are you gonna look at whether or not the probability of survival increases if they have to use the river outlet tubes since there aren't any turbines in those, or is that kind of beyond your scope? That's beyond the scope, and that's a very good point, though. The probability of survival should almost certainly go up since there are no turbines, and it's, it's a straight shot. I mean, the pipe isn't straight, but it is just riding through a pipe, essentially, so I would expect high survival. I've been accidentally calling the fish bypass. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, 